I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. This is Scripture Central's Come Follow Me Insights. This episode, the second part of Matthew 1 and Luke 1, will focus on Luke 1, the story of Mary and the birth of Jesus. So as we talked about in the first episode with Matthew, he's focusing more on the, the Jewish perspective, on the men's perspective, on Joseph's story and his genealogy. Now, for the second episode, we shift our focus to Luke, who is a Gentile convert. He wasn't a, a Jewish disciple of Christ during his ministry, traveling with him as one of his apostles. And so you'll notice as he opens his gospel, he gives us a little bit of a, a, a background as to who he is as well as who his audience is. So we begin in verse 1, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. In other words, to translate that into to modern English, he's saying a lot of people have written a lot of things about Jesus, but even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, so these people who saw these stories, they, they were eyewitnesses and they were ministers of the word, they've delivered these stories and we've read their writings, they're delivered to us, Luke comes to a conclusion in verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order most excellent Theophilus. What a great name! Theo is God, and Philus or Philo comes from the root for? Love or friendship. So a friend of God or a lover of God or a friend of God is his audience. It's probably – it could be Luke's benefactor, it could be the, the master because Luke is a physician, which doesn't mean he's gone to medical school and now he's making millions of dollars as a physician. It means he's a servant whose master sent him off to get some training to come home into the household of that master to provide some some help when people get sick. So a physician back then isn't a, a very high and prestigious uh, occupation, it just means he's, he's been trained to, to heal and to help people with, with physical ailments. And so whoever Theophilus is seems to, to be benefiting Luke and he's writing his gospel specifically to him and consequently, he's writing it in a way where he's going to expound a little bit on some of the Jewish culture, on some of the practices that you're going to read about in, this, in the gospel, where somebody who isn't an insider in Jewish culture might be saying, wait, what, what is that all about? Luke is going to give you a very balanced gospel where he's explaining things, he's focusing a lot on not just the story but on people who often get overlooked on the margins of society, often in their cultures, the women, the children, the sick, the afflicted, the oppressed, the, the shepherds, the servants, people who others aren't even going to pay any attention to, they're going to get some, some serious attention from Luke who has gathered his information from all these sources, eyewitness accounts as well as books, and so you're really going to love reading Luke's gospel if you want to see a very approachable and kind and gentle, healing, loving, forgiving Jesus. You're going to feel that perspective coming from Luke's gospel as he's sharing this story with Theophilus. Luke, like Matthew, is trying to convince people through words about who Jesus is, that he is the one who's come to save. And we get part of this in, in verse 4. It says, Theophilus, I, Luke, am writing that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So imagine Theophilus is somebody who's received the missionaries, he's had an oral presentation already about Jesus, and perhaps Theophilus is somebody of, who has some means or resources to hire somebody educated like Luke who's had access to the eyewitnesses, and Luke now takes the time to write this, this biography about Jesus to convince Theophilus about the gospel. This is important to know about the gospels. 
the underlying word gospel does mean the good news. It's related to the word for angel. Somebody who's a messenger who tells you these amazing things, this joy of salvation. It turns out that the, the structure or the narrative style that the gospels use, primarily Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is a biography, but not a biography in the way we consider it. Biographies today are these like massive, large books of like every little detail in somebody's life. Anciently, biographies were much shorter, and they typically would only start um, around the public career of some famous or compelling individual. So consider the Gospel of Mark. We don't hear anything about Jesus until he gets baptized. Matthew and Luke are the only ones that tell us about the birth. And then they essentially skip over much of Jesus' life and get right to his public ministry. So these biographies are written to highlight around clustered themes about the character of Jesus. So when, G when Luke says, I am going to write in order, he means I'm going to use a thematic structured approach to collect these stories about Jesus and present them to you to convince you that Jesus is the one who has come to save. And our hope is that we can get the same message. Sure, sometimes there's details that might be a little confusing. As we read the New Testament, it's an ancient time, ancient culture. But ultimately, these texts have been preserved to also convince us that we too can believe and know that Jesus is the Christ, the one who comes to save. So as you say that, look at the name once again. You have this, this man who is the, the recipient of this letter, or this gospel rather, that uh, Luke is writing. And his name, remember, is a lover of God or a friend of God? Well, if you take what Taylor just said, oh my heavens, I'm in Luke's audience. Luke, I get it, Luke was writing to an individual in his day named Theophilus. Symbolically, metaphorically, Luke is writing to you. You're taking time to study the life of Christ. You are a Theophilus. You are a friend of God, a lover of God, and so you can take this, this gospel very personally. You can see Luke telling you these stories, even though you're not that individual guy back in the first century, the principle's the same. He's trying to convince you that Jesus is the Christ even if you feel like you're on the margins of society, overlooked, forgotten, not talked about. So his prologue finishes in verse 1 through 4, and now he, he jumps into the actual story. Verse 5, there was in the days of Herod, the king, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So he opens his story trying to convince Theophilus, lover, this lover of God, maybe a new convert, maybe somebody who's, who's a friend of the church at the time trying to figure out if he's going to become a Christian. Uh, he's, he's trying to teach him that Jesus is the Christ, and he starts not with Jesus' story but with a side story with Zacharias and Elizabeth, two people who quite frankly would be very easy to overlook for a couple of reasons. Zacharias is old. He's a priest. You have 24 priestly families at the time in the first century, and they are given the assignment for two weeks to go into the temple and perform all of the priestly functions of the temple, and then when your two weeks are done, the next family group of priests comes in and they perform all of those ordinances. Some of you are thinking to yourself, wait, 24? Well, 24, two weeks each, that's only 48, but there are 52 weeks in the year, so how does that work? They did that on purpose so that these families would keep cycling through so that the same families wouldn't always keep getting the Feast of the Passover and the Feast of the Pen Pentecost and the Feast of the Tabernacles, the big events, so that they would just keep cycling their way through all these, these different groups. Zacharias is in that group of this one family that for two weeks has the assignment, but he's old, and his wife Elizabeth is beyond the childbearing years, and she is barren. Notice what he says in verse 6. 
because being barren in the ancient world, if you didn't have children, people assumed that was a punishment from God. You must be a bad person. And notice that before Luke indicates that they're barren, he says they were they walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, and that they were blameless. So it, they were not barren because of anything they had done. So he's providing some context within the culture. These were godly people, and God was going to work through them in a way that caught people's attention because it was different than what people would expect. You do not expect an old couple to have a child. Sounds like other stories we've seen in the scriptures. Absolutely. We've seen that a few times in the Old Testament. And keep in mind, from Luke's perspective, in a Greco-Roman culture that have fully adopted these Greek philosophies that, that Taylor was talking about, you, there's divine disfavor going on here. You've, you've displeased one or more of the gods, and so they're punishing you. I wonder if in our culture today there are still some of these, these remnants of the Greek philosophies that are alive and well, where if bad things happen to you or to your loved ones, if we sometimes don't instantly jump to the, oh, what did I do wrong? Or what should I have done better? Or who, how could I have prevented this? And in some cases the answer is there are some things that we could have done, but often, as is the case with Zacharias and Elizabeth, it's not a sign of divine disfavor. It's part of life, and in this case, it's part of the Lord's plan. So he's executing the priest's office as part of his job. He, it was his lot. He had been chosen in his little family uh, group of priests there to officiate the ordinances of the temple for that two-week period. He had received the lot to be the one to go in at the hour of prayer and to burn incense, to take some incense off of the table of showbread and put it on the altar of incense so that the smoke could ascend in front of the veil. Now, as you look at this beautiful 3D uh, rendition of the holy place inside of the temple, you can, you can picture as you look back towards the people out there beyond the court of the priests, out into the court of the Israelite men, and through the Nicanor gate out into the court of the women, you can picture every morning and every afternoon the people gathering and their prayers are ascending to heaven, and now we turn and look into the holy place and walk in towards that uh, beautiful veil up to the altar of incense with the menorah on our left and the table of showbread on our right. You can picture Zacharias walking in here when the following happens. Verse 10 says, the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense, and there appeared unto Zacharias an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. This is a pretty typical reaction that you would expect in the ancient world. When people are seeing a divine messenger, usually it was a, there was a bit of like shock and surprise. And I learned this from our colleague, Carrie Muelstein, an interesting thing from Greek theater is that messengers who came in from the right side of the stage were seen as good news. If a messenger came in on from the left, it was bad or foreboding news. So it's interesting, this little detail that Luke provides. I mean, we would think, does it really matter? Is he in front of the altar, behind the altar, left or right? But from a cultural context for the Greek hearers of Luke's gospel, He's already signaling to them, this is a messenger who's going to provide really good news. So the, the message of the angel is, verse 13, fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Now, there's a lot that we don't know. The question could be asked here, wait a minute, did Zacharias that morning before coming into the temple to perform this priestly function, or as he's coming into the temple, is he praying, Heavenly Father, please bless me and my wife with a son, with a child. Is that possible? I guess it's possible, but I don't know how probable it is that Zacharias is praying for a son because we were already told in verse 7 that they were now well stricken in years, well advanced, they're old, and coming from a physician like Luke, it's almost a signal from him to say, 
yeah, it's impossible. The childbearing years have passed for Elizabeth. It's not going to happen, which now brings up the question from verse 13 when the angel says to him, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. What prayer is he talking about? Is he talking about a prayer that morning, or is he talking about the, a deep, heartfelt prayer that has been a part of Zacharias and Elizabeth's uh, life for decades before, from the time they got married until the, the childbearing years ended, I would imagine there were countless prayers, countless tears on their pillow at night when, when they realized we're not able to have children for whatever reason, and their culture was telling them, you must be really bad, and they're, they're wrestling with these cultural struggles as well as internal sense of inadequacy or self-doubt, and the Lord didn't see fit at any of those times to take that barrenness away. And now that the time has passed, the angel says to them, or to him, thy prayer is heard. Brothers and sisters, it's my belief that every single prayer is heard, and God gives us the very best-case scenario answer, even though it may not fit our paradigm of what the best-case scenario ought to be, we have to trust that the Lord God of the universe who holds worlds without, his, without number in his hands, he holds your world in his hand, and he knows what's best for us, even when it's painful, even when it may not make sense, even when it may feel like, I deserve this, it's a righteous desire. I'm seeing other people who, who aren't trying as hard as me being blessed with more than what I'm even asking for. I, I just want this simple thing, and, and I've, I've earned it. I deserve it. And still he withholds it. So for me, the Zacharias and Elizabeth principle is one of, Tyler, do you really trust the Lord? I can almost hear in the back of my mind, the voice of the Lord saying, do you really trust me? Will you really give me your whole life, put it into my hands, and then trust me that I know what I'm doing when it comes to when and how and in what manner I give you things, whether they be blessings and opportunities or trials and struggles or callings or relationships. And I think if Elizabeth and Zacharias, if they were here today, I think they would say, God hears and answers prayers, not according to our timing and not always according to our will, but he hears and answers every prayer. Another great thing you can learn from this is the connection to the Old Testament, where you have two really important stories of older couples or of people who have not been able to have children. So famously, you have Abraham and Sarah, who, similar to Zacharias and his wife, and Elizabeth, are struggling to have kids, and then the promised child comes. So people who are hearing this story should be able to kind of reflect back and say, wow, this sounds like another time where God did the impossible, did the miraculous. Then there's an important connection from this New Testament story back into the Old Testament, the story of Hannah and her husband Elkanah, where she couldn't have children, she prays to God at the tabernacle, and he blesses her with the son Samuel, who is one of the greatest prophets of all time in Israelite history. And he essentially prepares the way for the greatest king in Israelite history, David. And so there's these clear echoes that you're going to have John, who's going to be born of this barren couple, It's a lot. who's going to prepare the way for the new king who will save his people, just like you had Hannah, the barren Hannah, give birth to Samuel, who prepared the way for King David to also save and protect his people. I love those connections. Uh, and here you get Zacharias, who gets some information about the baby who, who hasn't even been conceived yet. The angel Gabriel is giving him some information. So, as Taylor already mentioned at the bottom of verse 13, you're going to call his name John. The, the second thing, there are many who are going to rejoice at his birth, 
not just you, Zacharias. He, he mentions Zacharias, but John's birth is going to be this miraculous birth because that's what Luke 1 is all about, is two people who miraculously are going to have a child, one who's too old and one who's never known a man. So two impossible births, two baby boys, these, these close relatives, and about six months apart, as we're going to see here. Look at what he says in verse 15, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb, which we're going to see here a little bit later. So now, Zacharias initially didn't believe, the angel tells him he's, he's not going to be able to speak, gives him his name, until the baby's born, you're not going to be able to speak, Zacharias. So he comes out having tarried, verse 21, the people waited for Zacharias and they marveled that he tarried so long in the temple, and when he comes out, he's clearly, they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. He's different and he can't communicate, he can't share what he, what he had experienced. And I've wondered about that because there are times in my life, and I'm sure you can think of times in your own, where you've experienced things of the Spirit to such a degree where you can't put words on it, you can't describe it to somebody. There are certain things, spiritual experiences, that can only be experienced for yourself. You can talk around them, you can try to describe them from various angles, but at the end of the day, these are, th these are experiences that you have to go through yourself to fully understand them. And so one element of that seems to be at play here. So you'll notice in verse 24 it says, after these da those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months. So she goes, she goes into hiding thinking, what is everybody going to think? I, everybody knows I'm well beyond the childbearing years. This is, this is not normal and people have already been talking for decades about what's wrong with her. You, we don't know why she went into hiding, but the implication is she just wants some, some privacy. She wants some alone time here. And so now we shift from Zacharias and Elizabeth to the birth of Christ. Look at verse 26. And in the sixth month, the implication is it's the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, and you can see that over in verse 36 again, that it's in that sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And what's her name? It's Mary. And notice when the angel came in unto her, he said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. It's interesting to me that every other time that the angel comes to people, the very first two words out of the angel's mouth in every other story here seems to be, fear not, fear not, but not with Mary. He delivers an entire message there in verse 28 before Mary seems to be more troubled, and she's not troubled at the presence of the angel, she's troubled at what the angel said. Verse 29, when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind, what manner of salutation this should be? What, what is, why am I highly favored? I love Mary's meekness. I love Mary's humility. I love the fact that she's troubled at what he said. What he said is, you're highly favored and the Lord is with you and blessed are you among women. And she's sitting there thinking, me? I, and then he says to her, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David." So we already talked about in Matthew chapter 1 the significance of the throne of King David and being a son of David to fulfill those messianic expectations or prophecies of who our deliverer is going to be, and here you get it in Luke's gospel as well, he's going to sit on the throne of his father David. Uh, can you picture being a young handmaiden in a small village in northern Galilee, and this angel comes to you, and, and by the way, you are betrothed to be married to Joseph, and 
the angel says, you're going to conceive and bear a son. Can you picture the response of, oh, good, that's wonderful, because you know the cultural context of what's going to happen to you. You know how despised and rejected of all men and women you're going to become when you're found with child out of wedlock. There are few people in scriptures that are more Christ-like than his own mother, Mary. Did you see that? She is so highly favored of the Lord, so highly favored of heaven, that it's going to cause her to become despised and rejected of humans, of people on the earth. I think Jesus is going to learn some of his first lessons about how to move forward doing the right thing in the face of rejection and people misjudging you and labeling you and pointing fingers at you because you did the right things, because heaven chose you to do things heaven's way according to heaven's timing. I think uh, the mother of Jesus, Mary, is able to teach him some very real lessons that are going to come in handy later on in his ministry and ultimately in his atoning sacrifice. I love how the angel gets to this high point of the conversation because Mary is wondering, how is this all going to happen? The angel has to explain, listen, your cousin Elizabeth is in also a similar situation where in an unexpected way she is now expecting. We get this very powerful verse, for with God nothing shall be impossible. We think in our own lives, are there seemingly impossible situations? And yet with God, he can solve everything. Perhaps we can't do it on our own, and maybe not everything gets resolved the way we want in our time, in our place, but God ultimately can solve all problems. And I know in my own life, when I have been in very difficult circumstances, this verse and these stories about God doing the absolutely unexpected has given me hope and perseverance to continue to trust God even when my fallen nature brain says, Taylor, here's all the evidence for why you shouldn't trust God or you would think that God could not pull off an amazing miracle, and he does. Now, I will also say there have been times in my life things have not turned out the way I wanted, and yet, as I look back on my life, I've seen that God has done the impossible and brought my life to a point that I could have never built for myself, but only he could have done. And I, I think we see this going on as well with these faithful women in this New Testament time period. And isn't that a beautiful principle that applies to us in our day, this idea of let's not wait until God performs those miracles to then engage in righteous covenant-keeping, moving forward on the covenant path kinds of behaviors. We move forward before we see the end from the beginning whether it's Elizabeth, who stays true and faithful with her husband Zacharias through decades without seeing any, any real results that they had been hoping and praying for, and then in the end the gift is given. Now we see it from the other side of that sequence with Mary where she's entering in and she's told, you're going to conceive, so she moves into this process of keeping covenants and, and righteous living without having an assurity that everything is going to be according to God's will and turn out okay, she, she engages in this process by submitting to the Lord's will in some of the most beautiful words you're ever going to read anywhere. So right after being told, with God nothing shall be impossible, how does this young handmaiden of the Lord respond? She says, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. She doesn't say, wait a minute, hold on. She's already asked her questions about the logistics, wait, this is impossible, but the angel says, no, nothing with God is impossible, and so now she completely submits herself to God's will. Do you think that a young 
baby Jesus as he grows through those childhood years, do you think he learns some things about what it means to say to God, not my will, but thine be done from his beloved mother? And he then takes those those teachings to a whole new infinite level in his infinite atonement. Uh, you'll notice that Mary doesn't linger in Nazareth after this experience. This is a condition you do not want to be found in, in their culture, in their day, in that setting. So in verse 39 we read, And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste unto the city of Judah. Implication being, she hurried. She left Nazareth and went down south. Judea or Judah is down south in the, in the region round about Jerusalem, Bethlehem. She goes down to, to a city of Judah in the hill country, and she entered into the house of Zacharias, and she saluted Elizabeth. She greeted Elizabeth as she comes into, the, into her home. Remember, this visitation from Angel Gabriel happened in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, and with haste Mary left Galilee, the region up north, came south. Maybe a week later she comes into the house of Elizabeth. We don't know for sure the timing, but it's with haste. She hurries down there, and one of the most beautiful stories in all of the New Testament is right here in this, this little two-verse sequence when she enters into Elizabeth's house. Verse 41 says, and it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Do you remember the promise that the angel Gabriel gave to Zacharias clear back in verse 15, that even from his mother's womb, John would be filled with the Holy Ghost? So here's a little, a little baby inside of his aged mother's womb, Elizabeth. He's a little over six months along in the pregnancy, and in the door walks a uh, Mary with a newly conceived Christ child in her womb, and John recognizes it, and he is going to do whatever he can to bear testimony and to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. So what can a little six-month-old baby in a womb do? Can't talk, can't can't do anything other than leap, and the Holy Ghost delivered his testimony to an audience of one. His mother felt the baby leap in the womb when Mary walks in the door, and it was more than just, whoa, my baby jumped. It was, oh, I now know who walked through the door. And you'll notice this, this statement, to, to Mary in verse 42, blessed art thou among woman, women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? That's an awful big message to get out of a baby leaping in your womb, which tells us the power of the Holy Ghost to carry our sometimes simple, sometimes small, efforts to bear testimony of Christ, the power of the Holy Ghost to translate those for the recipient to get the full message. Baby leaps in the womb, and Elizabeth got the, the word from heaven. Here comes the mother of the Son of God. Your Savior and re your Redeemer is now in the room. That's a profound message shared between two women, close relatives, and their little babies inside of their wombs. I love this story because it's in Luke's gospel. He's focusing on people who are largely going to be overlooked by their, the society of their time, and if you put it into a Jewish first-century context, they wouldn't see women as valid witnesses or valid testifiers in a Judaic court of law, for instance. If they witnessed a crime, they couldn't testify, only men could. And yet, who did heaven pick as the first two witnesses in the, in the Gospel of Luke of the coming of the Messiah? It's Mary followed by Elizabeth, these two women, both with impossible births, working their way to fruition here in this chapter.
Some years ago, when I was a student at the BYU Jerusalem Center, somebody shared an interesting insight that I have found meaningful about this connection between John and Jesus and their births. So John, as we know, was born six months before Jesus. That's 180 days. Now, if you take geometry, 180 degrees is a straight line. And what do we hear about John? He makes the pathway straight to prepare the way for Jesus. So just all these little connections for how John fulfills his role of being the forerunner, making the path straight for Jesus to come to all of us and offer salvation. I love that. And, and don't you also love the fact that John is fulfilling his divine commission, his divine mission, even when he's still in the womb? He's preparing the way for the Lord. He's testifying that Christ is coming. Make his path straight. I, I love that. And you'll see him then continue that same ministry of make his path straight and prepare the way of the Lord at the baptism event and sending his disciples to go and follow Jesus. And then ultimately, he's also going to be killed by Herod about six months before Jesus is going to end up being crucified. So he'll have an opportunity to go into the spirit world and do the same thing that he did here bear testimony that Jesus is the Christ, repent ye, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, because he's going to be following, he's going to be coming shortly after me, and that's his whole, his whole life story, and it begins six months along in this pregnancy. I love that. So then Mary, in verse, beginning in verse 46, she begins uh, this song. We, we call it in Christianity that in Christianity, the Magnificat, and it's very, very significant to many people in other religions, um, this, this song where she says, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the low esteem of his handmaiden, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, for he that is mighty hath done to me great things and holy is his name." And so that, that song of Mary is going to continue down, and you can read it all the way down through the end of verse 55. So in verse 56, you'll see that Mary abode with Elizabeth about three months and returned to her own house, and then it seems that Elizabeth's full time was come and she delivered this son, and they were about to name him something, but Zacharias wrote, no, his name is John. <laughs> The angel told me that. Even though we have no, no men named John in our family genealogy lines, his name is John. There's an interesting thing here that our friend and colleague Kent Brown has pointed out, that in the ancient world, women often were not literate, and it's the fact that Zacharias can't talk, now it's going nine months. Now imagine a marriage where you can't talk to one another for nine months. I mean, I think it'd be quite difficult. By the way, my wife went deaf a few years ago. She got cochlear implants, and it's interesting. We're like a typical family where we have to have lots of conversations about things, and every now and then, I have to remind myself, even with cochlear implants, my wife does not catch every word. And so you think about any typical conversation that can go wrong and now create the situation where maybe you're missing 25% of the words. We don't really know how Zacharias and Elizabeth communicated over nine months. If she's illiterate, and if he's going to be writing things, how is she going to know really anything that's going on in terms of the relationship and communication? So there's some interesting way that she must have learned from her husband what the name is, but I think it's compelling that they've gone through this struggle for nine months of not having full communication with one another. So in some ways, Elizabeth was cut off from her husband, not be able to hear him for nine months. And I just think that must have been a trial that she had to endure with faith, and also for him to be able to not communicate with his wife. So there's just these background possibilities that are just passed over very quickly in these verses that, yeah, get me a tablet and I'll identify that his name is John, and in that is nine months that they may not have had any real full-on conversations as a couple. So at that point, his speaking ability is restored and 
you, you can see what happens, verse 67, Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and he prophesied. I love that. He's not been able to speak for nine months. He can now speak, and what does he begin with? He begins with this beautiful prophecy, this beautiful song, if you will, in verse 68 down through the end of this chapter almost, saying things like, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. I love how Zacharias is speaking in a past tense sense, even though it, it hasn't happened yet. That's how firm his faith is in God. That's how much he trusts God. He has redeemed his people even though the Redeemer is still six months away from being born uh, from, from Mary, and he, he talks about Abraham and the oath that was given to Father Abraham, how our child, John, is going to help fulfill that promise. These are really important verses. The Old Testament is centered, among other things, on two really important covenants, the first being God's everlasting, unbreakable covenant that he made to Abraham, that through Abraham, that Abraham would have posterity, prosperity, priesthood, property, and that all the families of the earth would be blessed. Okay, this is unbreakable covenant. This is God's promise to Abraham. And one of the purposes of the Old Testament is to show how God in all of his everlasting mercy has been unfailingly loyal to that promise that he made. And of course, at Mount Sinai, we have the revelation given to us of what God expects of us, and we'll see in the New Testament how that's updated by, by Jesus. What's interesting here is that these Jews understand that God had obligated himself to provide salvation to the people. And Zacharias is now making this totally clear that Jesus is coming as a fulfillment of a promise that God made centuries ago to our forefather Abraham that salvation would come. And we hope that as you're reading the scriptures, you remember these core themes and concepts, that God is a covenantal God, he wants to be in relationship with us, he made these covenants from a long time ago, and he will do everything to fulfill his end of the bargain. Zechariah witnesses of this. Verse 72, God will perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham. If ever you have wondered about God's qualities, mercy is probably the most important defining factor. And that promise that God made to Abraham that is now available to all of us, it's all about mercy, that God in his mercy sends someone to save us. And that person is named with the name of salvation. It is Jesus. So as we conclude our study here of Luke chapter 1, I, it is our hope that you will be able to hear the voice of Elizabeth combined with Zacharias and add to those two the voice of Mary, their testimonies coming into your mind and into your heart through, through time and space reminding you that with God nothing shall be impossible. If we'll, if we'll say to him, as Mary said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word, if we're willing to put our life, our future, everything that we have, everything that we hope to become into the hands of he who holds world without number in those hands, and trust him and move forward in faith like never before on the covenant path, seeking to become even more so a, a true and faithful child of that covenant, then it is our testimony that he will shape you, he will bless you, and he will guide your future as he has the past. He lives and he loves you, and we leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We hope you know how much you're loved.